to the October 10th, 2023 meeting of the Campbell Planning Commission. I'm Adam Bookbinder. I'm chair for this evening. Uh, Mr. Clerk, may you please call the roll? Commissioner Davis? Present. Commissioner Majewski? Commissioner Ostrowski? Commissioner Craig? Here. Commissioner Capcar? Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Fizzer? Here. Chair Buckbinder? Present. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go any further, um, does Community Development Director have any communications, agenda modifications, or postponements? Do not check my mind. Thank you. Uh, brings us to oral communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for individuals wishing to address the Planning Commission on matters of community concerns that are not listed on the agenda. Um, we have up to five minutes, but the uh, Commission may not take any action on these Open the public hearing. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just want to make sure the minutes are, are or are not on your agenda for adoption. Oh, there! I'm doing are. this in the wrong order. I am terribly sorry. I just I I'm winging it here. Yeah. Close the public hearing briefly. Has everyone had the chance to review the minutes? Sure. Sorry about that. Does anyone have any notes on them? I'll, I'll, I'll move to uh, approve the minutes of Zip Thank you. Second. Please have a, a vote. Commissioner Davis? Aye. Commissioner Crape? Aye. Master Scissor? Aye. Chair Buckminder? Aye. Thank you. Now, this is the portion of the meeting where any member of the public may address the commission on an item not on the agenda. We may not take any action on the say, but you may have up to five minutes. We'll open the public hearing again. Does anyone want to speak on an item not on the agenda? Anyone online? Close the public hearing. All right, that brings us to uh, item two on the agenda, which is PLN 2023-155, a study session on housing overlay districts and related amendments. Um, I believe Stephen is going to give us our presentation. Uh, I'll start uh, pretty quickly over to Stephen. So uh, thanks for your attention tonight, commissioners. We know this was a pretty dense report, but we're here to walk through it. Any questions you have? Uh, broadly speaking, you'll remember back in April, uh, so we had heavy lift of adopting the general plan and housing elements with the EIR and its objective standards. Uh, in our housing element, we have a lot of ambitious policies and programs to help uh, housing and affordable housing development in the city. Uh, staff starting to work on those programs, and this is probably one of the first. Um, slew of programs that you're going to see. So uh, given they're on similar time frames, uh, we're bringing them to you in one package. But, but generally what you'll see tonight are tools that will help support affordable housing development or streamline affordable housing development or incentivize affordable housing development in Campbell. Um, broadly speaking, there's one set of tools uh, that Steve will talk about, affordable housing overlay zone. It's sort of akin to a local density bonus program where the city can decide how to incentivize more affordable housing of a certain type and decide what sort of sweeteners or incentives in addition, above and beyond what you normally get in our density bonus, I'd like to offer uh, developers and affordable housing developers that provide those uh, additional things the city's looking for. And then two, as required by state law and also in our uh, housing element, we are required to rezone certain properties to allow by right for affordable housing development. The city has some discretion on, on what properties should be rezoned. And tonight we'll talk to you a little bit about um, what, what principles you'd like or what's important to the city on where you would allow by right zone. Uh, broadly speaking, these are kind of going back to the housing element days. Uh, we'll be presenting items and looking for your feedback. Uh, we talked a little bit with Chair Buckbinder on the format. Uh, we were proposing we would break it off in two bite, biteable chunks, uh, as you'd say. So one would be uh, Stephen will present on the affordable housing overlay zone. Stop if there's any public comments. Uh, you'd receive that and ask questions. And at that point, we have some some key policy questions that we'd like you to dig into and get your feedback. Uh, then we go into part two and three, uh, which are the reuse overlay and bite right overlay. Again, same format. Present, uh, stop, and members of the public want to provide comments, you can ask questions and then deliberate on your feedback on these items. So with that, uh, uh, I think we've covered generally, these are the housing element programs that we're focusing on. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Stephen to start with uh, the affordable housing overlay zone. Iterate. Um, the reason 
all three of these housing element overlays are being brought forward uh, for you tonight is given the similarities to the program requirements like we've read in the packet, but also the timeline for implementation. So the housing element, which was adopted earlier this year, uh, called for all three of these to be fully prepared and completed by the end of this year. Um, and again, just tonight's purpose is not a, we're not making a decision, it's a study session, so we're just looking for that initial feedback and direction, which we're able to take and uh, refine the overlays under consideration of development fire, fire division. So uh, as just mentioned by Rob, um, the intent of an affordable housing overlay zone, it's typically used to establish a local state density bonus program. It's usually the best way of characterizing it. Um, in development of an affordable housing overlay zone, it generally involves identification of areas where it will apply, as well as the identification of specific policy objectives, which is things that the city would want to see achieved, and incentives, which is things that you'd offer in exchange for a developer meeting those specific policy objectives. Uh, it was also, the, the affordable housing overlay zone was also mentioned several times in the development of the general plan of housing element as a possible tool which could be used to protect the city's uh, maximum height limit of 75 feet, as well as helping the city develop housing which would meet the needs of special needs populations like veterans, senior housing, et cetera. So in the report, we, we do discuss three key policy considerations, which we're looking for your feedback on tonight. Uh, the first is whether or not the affordable housing overlay zone should be designed to compete with or complement state density bonus law, which we'll go over in a little bit more detail here in a second. The second is what are exactly our, our local priorities? What are the most important things for the city to preserve or to protect? And what will the city be, what should or can the city offer up in exchange? These are really uh, trade-offs. And lastly, where in the city should the affordable housing overlay apply once we just, once it's established? So the first topic, uh, should the affordable housing overlay zone be designed to compete with or complement state density bonus law? Generally, a competitive program forces developers to choose between a city, the local city program and state density bonus law. And, and to clarify one point on this, State density bonus law will always be presented as an option. So the developer doesn't have to choose if they have their own elect whether or not they want to pursue the city's program, which is why it's critical that the city's program be competitive, that we make sure that we include enough sweeteners or incentives that they would opt to choose of their own accord our program over necessarily state density bonus law. Now, a, a truly competitive program is saying you're really uh, deciding to forego a state density bonus in exchange for all of the incentives and suites and incentives under the, the local program. Uh, as a result, uh, as a pro of this approach, it generally can allow a community to have greater discretionary, uh, greater control and predictability over project outcomes. But because state density bonus law is already so generous already, it's very difficult to be competitive because they already get so, so many um, concessions, waivers, the development standards, you're really only being able to offer those things which state density bonus law doesn't already offer. Uh, it also requires frequent maintenance as state density bonus law has been amended, I think, every single year for the last several years. If you did it, if you created a, a truly competitive program, you would need to ensure that your program is keeping up with state density bonus law. So every year you'd be looking at like annual updates. On a com complementary model, which is really what staff is recommending tonight. Um, it provides, it's really stacking. You, you pretty much get the same benefits you would otherwise get under state density bonus law, but the local program would be providing additional benefits in exchange for meeting one or more local priorities. You're, you're staying very focused on meeting just one or two or three local priorities, which are critical to the community and, and, and identifying um, appropriate incentives that may be offered in exchange. The city height limit is, is one example. We have other examples, which I'll cover on another slide. Um, some of the pros of this approach is it's easier to be competitive because you're not having to compete with all of state density bonus law, only those couple of things that you're asking for. Uh, also, uh, you're obviously not going to update the program as frequently, so there's lower maintenance obligations, and hopefully it's achieving uh, city priorities. So just in terms of local priorities and uh, potential incentives the city may consider in exchange, these are really the trade-offs. So in, in the development of both the general plan and the housing element, the city had discussed the city's maximum height limit, as well as that special uh, meeting needs of special needs populations like veterans and seniors. 
uh, as potential priorities. We had also heard uh, at various points in time during the development of the city's multifamily development design standards, this is the, the objective design requirements that apply to multifamily and new mixed use development projects, that it was very important to the community to also protect uh, single family residences by the, through the establishment of adjacency standards. These are things like the, the wedding caking, the stepping back of buildings, providing adequate separation of setbacks to those property lines where single families in play but also preserving and protecting uh, the city's requirement for mixed use development, particularly in the downtown. These are things which could otherwise be waived under state density bonus law. Uh, just as a list of incentives, some of these are actually identified in the housing element itself as uh, in the development of this program that we should be considering, such as increased density or intensity of projects, reduced or, or waived, deferred or waived uh, permit fees. Uh, some of these were also identified by staff uh, separately, just part of this report is potentially once we've established a an affordable housing fund or linkage fee, we could potentially prioritize the use of funds from that program towards housing developers who meet our local priorities. Uh, we could also allow for, and this is a somewhat complicated topic, but it's the selection of which units in a project are going to be the below market rate housing units. Right now, the city's inclusionary housing ordinance requires it to be a reasonable disbursement of those units across the same unit mix and composition across the project site. Developers would generally rather choose to, to locate their BMR units in the locations that are less attractive for market rate purchase. So this could be up against the highway, they could be the smaller units or less attractive units. So it could be something that the city could consider as a concession. Uh, ministerial or by right permit processing, so he has a utility undergrounding ordinance, so they would waive the requirements under that ordinance. Uh, the city could offer funding in support of, maybe not entirely funding of, uh, frontage improvements that would be like curb, better sidewalk, and, and other financial incentives such as uh, like smart passes on BTA and the like. So just to help visualize how a city program might be structured to compete with state density bonus law. What you see here on the screen is an example between a, a what state density bonus law would other would typically allow and how a local program might be competitive with that. So even under state density bonus law, there are certain concessions being asked for. In this particular scenario, a developer would be required to provide 10% of the units in a project affordable to lower income households. The city could similarly require 10% of those units to be available to lower income households, but also require that the, that the project comply with the city's maximum height limit. Um, in exchange, in addition really to those, those benefits that a developer would receive under state density bonus law, those being a 20% density bonus, parking standards and limited waivers, instead of where under state density, density bonus law, you'd only receive one incentive, a local program could provide two on-menu incentives. These would be where we specifically say, instead of an unknown incentive will specifically provide a waiver to the undergrounding requirements or an incentive for a ministerial by right permit process against a permit which to go effectively straight to our building department review. So if it's only clearance of sorts. So the third and final, um, so under this part, under the affordable housing overlay really zone, the last key policy consideration that we flagged is really where in the city should the affordable housing overlay really zone apply? Uh, one tax, uh, state density bonus law applies citywide, so the city could uh, obviously consider applying the affordable housing overlay zone the same way, applying it citywide as well. And alternatively, we could consider aligning it with existing planning boundaries, such as the, say, the future Hamilton Avenue uh, precise plan boundary, the Winchester Boulevard master plan, the downtown development plan, you could take. Um, or applying the AHOS to specific land uses. These would be like the city's higher density or transit-oriented mixed-use land use designations that were established as part of the general plan update. So you could select and say, we want to keep these ones in play and these particular land use designations like single family out of the picture. Uh, to that point, uh, staff is recommending that we consider to, to get to help hope, understanding that affordable housing overlay zone is intended to achieve additional affordable housing units to try to have a very broad applicability program by applying it citywide, but to potentially avoid uh, adverse impacts to single family areas, we would, we would seek to accept those areas and allow those, those areas of the community, say, say Santa Moss or 
areas that are single family to be addressed by other housing element programs, such as SB10, which are going to be under separate consideration in the future. So with that, we'll, that, that brings us to the end of part one. So we're going to go ahead and stop for public comment, uh, and then we'll turn it back to the Planning Commission for questions and feedback. And these are the key, the three key policy considerations up here on the screen. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'd just like to, uh, before we do a couple of comments, I'd just like to thank staff for really moving on this very quickly. I've seen a lot of news about um, other cities, um, like turning down or delaying programs they promised to do. Um, I really appreciate the work that's been put into this. Very excited to get started on this. Um, I'll open the public comment. Would anyone here like to speak on this item? We're online. Okay, close the public comment. So, um, well, we've got plenty of room for people to opine. Um, let's go one, two, three, four. Just questions and then uh, yeah, it's comment term. I think questions for staff and then we'll do another round of our opinions. Um, thank you. Um, the on-menu incentives that we offer, would those need to be available to every single property the same set or could we be customizing them we'd like realize this one property okay we really want that one to do frontage and undergrounding but then other properties we want to waive parking and like could we could we alter the menu on a per property basis or does it need to be consistent citywide i would generally refrain from doing the site by site application of a, of a policy like an affordable housing overlay zone in a way. Okay. What you could do is you could customize a list of specific incentives that may be offered to certain density ranges. So you'd say within these land use designations, those are between 57 and 75, the following options, menu options are available in the lower rung or lower set up or in certain areas of the committee. It's set up like a, within a certain area plan boundary, certain incentives may be offered. I'd certainly offer those as approaches that may be considered, but I wouldn't, I, I would try to veer away from doing a site assessment of every property you have, which ones you have on the ground. Makes sense. Um, special needs housing, is that, I don't know the background of the city council request, is that about who can purchase the houses or is that like actually building like different types of housing for people with special needs? Like what, what is the background on that? Yeah, that's, that's the general, so generally speaking, special needs housing is meeting the special needs of this population. So it could be something like a, uh, a providing a greater percentage of, of uh, accessible units in a housing development project that might unite the needs of special needs populations with disabilities, either mental or physical disabilities. So that's an example. Other types of housing might meet the needs of other groups. So, and I'll, I can provide one more example. So say a veteran community might have some type of on-site so, on, on supportive service to, to deal with certain traumas or experiences that they might have had. Not, not probably the best example, but. Do those also get limited then? Like there's some sort of like verification of like who can purchase those properties? Is that, no, like, yes. I, I would say that the clearest example of that would be with senior housing projects that they will generally be age restricted. Yes. Uh, I, I, it would be dependent, I don't know, depending on how the development agreement was set up, whether or not we could restrict units to special needs populations. Correct. It would be something we would explore in greater detail. That's something we'd like to show. And um, for the menu incentive about funding support or financial incentives, um, I know we've like had budget issues as a city. Where would that money come from? Well, some of the options that you present as a financial incentives would be deferred or reduced permit fees, which, okay. So you could defer it, this is a time of collection. Entirely. But yeah, we'd absolutely have to evaluate the fiscal impacts and implications of any particular incentive that has a financial consequence and include that in an upcoming report. Got it. And um, 
max height being like first on the list of things the city cares about, like this maximum height limit was established by a voter referendum back in the 1980s, it was 1986 thereabouts. So it was, it was a topic of significance to the community of Campbell back in the 1980s. Okay. And so it, it had been a carried discussion point going forward in the development of housing element, these new plan for densities, and how do we respect the, the interests of the voters that have established that referendum all those many years ago. Got it. Uh, super helpful. Last one. Is there any California city locally that is doing a competitive housing affordable housing overlay, just for reference. I think I got a lot of examples of ones that aren't or are abandoning it, but like, is there any local city that's actually doing it? So yeah, the examples that were provided as an attachment, I think the majority of those surveyed that were responsive have started to, or have already modified their affordable housing overlay zones to become complementary models. Mm -hmm. There are, I could probably provide examples of competitive programs where they had, and again, they're not in well use. Many of the cities at which we were surveying were trying to say, okay, which programs not are, only have been adopted, this is one thing to have an adopted ordinance. Another thing to have one that's actually being practically used by developers and chosen in favor of um, an adopted ordinance. So those which we were surveying were those which had actually responded indicating, not only do we have one, but yes, it's in fact been used. We have two examples or three examples of that in the last two three years is why you're kind of seeing that that skewing, perhaps, because those those cities which had responded, nobody, yeah, we have one, but nobody's used it. We didn't, we had not included it. Got it. Great. Those are my questions. Thank you. Just a, a note, um, the tables in the in the packet uh, detail the competitive versus um, complementary. Like various cities that have done that and like pretty much lay out what you were saying, right? Correct. Right. Okay. Um, Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for that report. Yeah, it, it did a really good job of putting a lot of stuff understandable. I do appreciate it. I actually have a couple, I just have, you know, obviously I have more comments, just a couple questions and really kind of a couple different angles on what Commissioner Fields actually just asked you. And I we said so much stuff over the last couple of years on housing and, and what was our priorities. And I I actually did have the, the same thought uh, about the height limit. A number, but I know it was a big item, but uh, maybe this is a question for Bill, but I'm still not clear on the way the state law is now. And we have a, a 75 foot height limit that was voted on by the people in Campbell. But according to state law now, the developer can exceed that 75 foot height. Limit. Is that correct? That is correct uh, as either an incentive concession or even possibly a waiver. Okay. All right. Yeah, you know, if they okay. comply with the density bonus requirements. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I get what you said. I could be a really good incentive in certain areas, maybe not everywhere, but uh, anyway. Yeah. And, and if I may add on that point, the past was somewhat ambiguous in the state density bonus law without yeah. a voter, but they've made that resounding and clear with the okay. most recent legislative package. Uh, they specifically added reference to voter initiatives as being waiting. Uh, that's good, waiting good to know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good item for us, I think. Uh, and then the Commissioner Fields was also asking about the fees a little bit. I know we have the fees and there are a lot as an incentive, but I, I, I don't know how much those fees are, but I, do, do we know city-wise that that would be a big issue for the city of Campbell's finances if we start waiving all these fees? Would that become a, a big budget issue for us? I mean, we'd have to evaluate, again, the specific fees for waiving. I mean, there's different ways of structuring the fee program. What we present in the report were kind of three options. One would be reducing or waiving the deferment, right? This is kind of a option. And another approach the city may take is when we do take in development impact fee, so somebody opts out, they fee out of a unit that they would otherwise need to provide, the city would be using revenues which they've collected as a special purpose fund they could then use to help buy down or help support the development of that local housing project. One thing I'll add, Commissioner Cray, so, so Campbell, I mean, typically what larger, more robust programs have done to help affordable housing just hard is put skin in the game. The, the cities will actually fund, especially 100% affordable projects and subsidies. So at this point, 
that the city doesn't have much funding. We're coming back with tools to improve the funding. For cities that typically don't have affordable housing funds, if you do have a 100% affordable project, if the city can't subsidize it, many cities do go ahead and just subsidize the fees since it reduces the overall cost. So that's not that. That's not atypical, especially for a 100% affordable project. I'll also add that the city of Campbell, we, we don't have that many existing development impact fees. One of the only notable fees that we do have is a park in lieu fee. The city's program is structured in such a way that we do collect that in lieu fee even on affordable housing in its project. So it's, I, I don't want to say it's atypical, it, it, it's less common in other jurisdictions. That typically, that's a fee that you would first let go. That it, of those units, the market rate units you'd collect in lieu fee, but the affordable units wouldn't. So that's something we could also look at. Yeah, I think just we'll look, look at stuff there. One other area that comes up all the time, and I, I this I, I know I'm getting into the weeds, and there's probably no easy answer for this uh, when, we're, when we're talking about incentives. And for some reason, uh, in projects that provide 15% of affordable below market rate housing, they get a break. And then in some area, and it was 20% in some cases. And now I saw in our one of our reports in a different area of this was Menlo Park at 25 percent. 25 percent of the of the units are affordable, and they get the breaks. The developers get the breaks. So I, uh, and, and you talked about as one of the incentives to maybe look at higher density. So it seems to me I wonder if there's a way uh, if if we could look into you know. So what we're trying to do is make these project. Well, I'm getting into that question here, but. We're, Trying to, the question is, is there room to, for an incentive to say, you know, in a project of 50 plus units, you know, if at least 30% are below market rate, then we'll give you the breaks. Or as opposed to uh, 25 units, you know, if it's 15%, we'll give, is there a way to, to mess with the percentages that still might enable a developer and a lender to make enough money to actually do a project but the city would get more below market rate housing. I, I broadly say yes. I mean, there is a table in the city of law which indicates a specific level of affordability percentage that you would buy in exchange for a certain percentage of density bonus that you get in exchange. The city's program can certainly go a, a step further for a slightly higher percentage of affordability, getting providing a slightly higher density bonus. Well, yeah, that seems like something that we could put into our housing over the zone kind of thing as an incentive. But, uh, I, I, just, I just assumed that the state had, you know, when, when they came up with the original laws, it was 15%, and it was kind of like just a straight 15%. You can even do a loof in loofy. But if 15% of all your units were affordable, then that was, then you get the break. And, you know, how did they come up with 15%? And then you got, you know, a 200 unit project versus the, you know, 20 unit project, and it's still 15%. So, to me, the, the, the economics of the whole deal of what still makes these projects palatable for a developer and a lender that can actually make them doable has always been very hazy to me, but that's not a question, but it leads to my final question, which is the incentives that we were mentioning that you mentioned in your report, Stephen. Some of them seem pretty like a, possibly a big deal, extra density. Some of them seem, you know, wave underground utilities, which we're already waving anyway. So some of them seem like a real small deal. But my question for you specifically is, have we run these incentives by our development community community? And do we know if these are actually things that are would actually do something? Great question. That's part of what our next steps are going to be on this. So based on the feedback we received from the planning commission and council, so I can actually kind of refine the feedback and kind of come up with a more crystallized list of specific incentives and concessions that may be considered when they're shuffled to affordable market rate developers. Where the side comes back. Uh, thank you. I'm all done. Thanks. Okay. Some of what I was going to ask covered, but but um, <clears throat> uh, first is uh, regarding the potential incentives. So this list of uh, eight that you have here um, are these um, incentives that that uh, developers normally would not necessarily get in accordance with state law uh, as part of the density bonus or whatever else. 
Um, I, so that these are over and above any incentives that they would normally get. The way that we would structure it, generally, yes. And again, you do get a density bonus under state density bonus law. But once we're, I would say on the first point, we're saying increased density. So we would be saying, taking that same table I mentioned earlier, going a step further. So by providing an even greater so level of affordability by these requirement, you might get a density bonus in exceedance of what state density bonus law would otherwise provide. Uh, the reduced deferment or waive, waiving of fees is something that state density bonus law clearly does not allow for. Uh, prior use of supportive funds, generally not the case. There are certain types of projects which could qualify for prior use of those funds. But the state density bonus law would command it by itself. The selection of DMR units, also not something that's offered. Minister of Byright Permit Processing, not unless in conjunction with some other law like SB 35. Okay. Uh, waiving of underground requirements. This is an example. If they choose to use their concession that way, they could certainly do so. But then they'd be using their sole or maybe one only concession, or we might offer two in our program. Just this example. Okay. All right. So for the most part, these are over. Um, yeah, uh, going back to uh, what Davis was saying about, about about picking and choosing depending on the development, it's like uh, you suggested maybe you could do it by intensity. Um, it, it would be possible to also do it by kind of the size of the, I mean, it seems to me that like undergrounding utilities, I don't really know a lot about, you know, where and when you would want to do underground utilities, but it seems to me that if it was a small 10 or 20 unit parcel, you know, that maybe the existing utilities are fine. But if you're going to a 300 unit parcel, the underground utilities make a whole lot more sense. Is that one way that you could possibly um, differentiate? Uh, I would say it is. I, I would say that there is an economy of scale. I mean, a smaller project would generally benefit disproportionately or the waiving of undergrounding requirements compared to a large development project given the number of units to build it. So it generally helps smaller projects uh, more. Uh, you could you could approach it a different way rather than trying to identify this. It also things. makes the, the you know if it's a bigger project that is going to be there for like that, that having underground utilities makes it aesthetically and more desirable, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, some projects are required to underground just to provide egress or ingress for fire department access. It, it might be a different approach. It might be taken. So you could you could specify to Commissioner Fields' comment earlier certain maybe density ranges projects over or even project unit counts, projects up to X units can use that incentive or over Z, may use a different number. And maybe a different approach too would be, again, I, I don't like the idea of going partial specific. You could take large swaths of the city, like if you're on an image street, like those are important streets to the city, okay. where undergrounding is of paramount importance to the city to ensure that it be, like it be Hamilton and Baskin, that interior streets are of less local notoriety less visibility might be less important or less of a paragon importance to you underground again. Okay. All right. Well the, I, I think that's a good thing to look at. I, on the uh, on the incentive numbers, you know, the one incentive by state law I are suggesting two incentives. Is, is there a reason why we should only offer two incentives? It's two incentives seem like a, 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 a right thing to do or could we uh, offer three incentives? <laughs> Yeah, I'd say that the, the program example you're seeing here on the screen is merely meant to be representative. It's very possible we might need to provide 5, 10, 20 incentives, depending on exactly what additional concessions or requirements we're asking. Okay. Um, so it seems to me that the one um, disadvantage of competing, of complementary, I can't remember where that was, you had a disadvantage somewhere. Um, the one, one disadvantage, okay. no, it was the part where it said, um, you could end up with cookie cutter, you could end up with cookie cutter and something else, right? If we, if we do which one, um, 
if, if we do complementary, then we're, 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 we're leaving ourselves open to developers putting up cookie cutter um, buildings and maybe some other kind of building, something else there. Less articulated, I believe. Less, uh, less articulation stuff. So, so I guess my question is, is practically speaking, is that something that we feel would be a very likely thing to happen uh, if we went complementary, that we're leaving ourselves open? Or is there a way in which we can um, manufacture the way we're offering this to minimize that? This kind of comes down to that list of, there's a very, I can't emphasize enough, there's a very thin margin between really what the city can offer between the state density bonus program is already such a great program for developers to pursue. A very thin margin where you'd be offering something above and beyond what the city can afford to the financial point, or otherwise would be willing to concede or give up in exchange for meeting certain priorities. Now, if the city were to identify its highest priority is not maintaining, say, the height limit, but it was to ensure that there's a modulation of the building form. That's that's the most important thing. To ensure that cookie cutter development or articulated buildings are the priority, then that would be identified as that thing that you're looking for in exchange for utility undergrounding or whatever the you know, incentive package is. But again, the more things you ask for, the more you need to give up in exchange. At some point, it's not going to pencil for a developer to say, "I'm willing to subject my project to all of those obligations and requirements." So let me. Jump in a little bit to underline what Stephen said. Bill Cook. So today, so when these programs were first laid out years ago, how developers could use density about the floor was much lower, and local cities could offer a lot of incentives to get people to provide more affordable housing or special needs. And as, as Stephen has said, every year the the floor has risen. So I'll, I'll just be honest. I'll tell the council the same thing: is it'll be very hard for this program to compete with state density the ability to use waivers and concessions, developers, once they're in that program, they, I would say it's all powerful, but you can ask for a lot for city, no questions asked. Now, the, the one thing, in addition to potentially eking out a small area where you might provide more incentives, is a lot of developers want to work with the city. And if you establish these programs, what it really does is it tells a developer, here are the things that are important to the city that you provide, and here are the things that we want to protect. And often developers, if they see that, it's not a mystery as to what waivers they would ask for. They usually want to go through the process in not an adversarial way, but to work with the city. So not that they would absolutely use the program, but it declares to developers when they shape their projects, if they want to work with the city, oftentimes it's very clear what's the priority. Is. So one of the other general questions I have about this is, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about the 20%. We're talking about getting affordable housing, and um, so what, what we're trying to do, correct me if I'm wrong, is 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 we're trying to encourage uh, more BMR with market rate development uh, that uh, that they'll they'll take the, they'll do the 15 percent rather than the in lieu, or they'll do 20 percent. Well, they do twenty percent, even if they're not a reuse. Or, you know, last 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 cycles guys who have to use the twenty percent, I guess, right? So, so this is what this whole exercise is about: is trying to get the developers to buy into uh, to to take the density bonus, so that we can get the affordable uh, we can get the affordable housing of. Uh, 15 to 20%. I don't know if we've, are we, have we picked a number? Are, are we pushing to 20%? Is that what we're trying to do? I, I, I broadly say there is not a number set. So you would be defining those local priorities. Okay. And providing a direction out. So I can say the height is the priority or the percentage of affordability is the priority of the city. That's more important than the height. So you need to stipulate, provide a direction out. We're starting to, there are three overlays in consideration tonight. 20% does not have direct correlation with the one we're talking about right now. All right. It does provide for a different form of path to talk about. And, and, and so, you know, this comes back to something that uh, Commissioner Craig said about, about 
going higher on affordable uh, on the affordable housing percentage. Um, and I mentioned this in the past that um, you know getting getting the fifteen or twenty percent. You know, based on the arena, you can read the numbers, you can do math. You can't get there. You can't get there unless you do a number of 100% affordable housing projects. And it's actually a lot. <laughs> so, you know, if you, if you actually calculate, do, do the math on it, say, even if we got all the market rate guys to provide 20% of their market rate stuff, and we make the market rate number, which is whatever it is, 20 some hundred, uh, 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 22, 23, 24 units, um, uh, or, or thousand units, whatever it is. Um, and you got 20%. Well, well, our affordable rate housing is 50, is 40, is 50, 55% of the arena number. Okay, and from moderate down to very low. If you take those numbers, it's 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 over fifty percent of the total arena number. We'll never make the affordable housing numbers by even maximizing out PMRs, which means, and I know this is simplistic. Theory, I mean, I know it 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 means that we have to have a lot of 50 or 100 percent affordable housing projects. So, is that a question? And, and so, my question is, why are we, or are we going to look at ways to pursue beyond the below market rate stuff for affordable housing in some meaningful way? To, because I believe that that's where we should be emphasizing. You know, be. People are going to build uh, market rate housing, and then they're, and we're going to get some BMR. But you know, it's so hard to. We all know it's so hard to get the um, uh, hundred percent affordable because it's usually nonprofits, you know, and 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 um, and it doesn't it doesn't pencil out for for profit developers, right? So so my take is we can do all this, and we can all agree on this. But it doesn't solve the problem if we really believe we want to meet. If if the emphasis is affordable housing, the emphasis is really affordable housing. It says on the slide, then we're going to run. We're going to be. We're going to come up short unless we have some dramatic emphasis placed on effectively competing. And I know it's the competition for the developers to build. You know, I, I came up with a number that said we're going to have to build in the next uh, eight years, we're going to have to build one, uh, a dozen 100% affordable housing projects of 100 units each to meet, to, 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 to come close to our affordable housing numbers if you factor in the BMR. So, so th th that's beyond the pale, I, I think. And so my, my feeling is this is fine to do this whole exercise and come up with answers, but I would like to see us place some emphasis on it. And so my question is, is, is there another iteration here where we're going to look at uh, making it a question <laughs> uh, where we're going to look at going beyond this? So, so I'll answer your question. All right. Your question again. So what you're seeing, if you read our housing only, we have, 100 plus programs. And what you're seeing tonight is two, well, technically three tools out of that program. And what the Commission and Council will see over the next two years is multiple other tools coming. And a lot of those are focused on building resources in the city to underwrite, support, subsidize, and build a fund for projects, potentially using city land to subsidize, underwrite. So what you see tonight is one tool, but there are multiple tools the city has to use. If you want to focus on this tool, and you'd say that the priority of the city is uh, for its special needs. Uh, putting words in the commission's mouth and other things, what we need is 100% affordable projects. The policy direction of staff would be, as I think one is the city out of the list that Stephen provided, is really focus on those 100% affordable projects. 
that's where staff will focus on the program oriented towards. I, I just don't think we have we don't have time. You know, eight years is a short period. You know, if we really want to see development, it's it's, it's gonna happen sooner. No, no, we'll come back around for discussion. I know. Um, so uh, I want to ask uh, on packet page eleven. There's a question about being uh, quote generous uh, being a problem for a local density bonus program. So what what's the bad outcome that we're worried about if we're too generous? So with the I think the implication of the point that point, it's difficult to be competitive, and if you and if you too generous. We could be offering up more than the city would otherwise need to make the project possible. So the, the disadvantage, I mean, I'm not saying that producing more affordable housing is necessarily a disadvantage. It could be offering up more financial incentives, as an example, than is necessary to fund, to help support the project, making it convert more units to be more affordable, if that's the, the concession or priority that's being asked for in exchange. So if you get under under that type of model, that's that's the that's the that's what that's the, so we might be inefficiently using our subsidy money based right. That's an example. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, to be clear, um, unless they're using SB thirty five or if it gets signed SB four twenty three. Um, density bonus projects don't get ministerial approval like they still have to go through a discretionary process. Correct. That sounds like a really like big incentive to be a co-author still, especially like people get cranky when you have special needs housing anywhere. Or why it's on our list. I that's that stuck out to me. Um, I guess everything else uh, there's comments. So um, shall we do another round of our feedback? Right, Take us away. Uh, just doing the questions in order um, on the screen. I think complimentary makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm just have for information on that. Um, in terms of local priorities, I I don't agree that max height is the top priority. I feel like having attended a lot of the um, feedback sessions right as I joined the planning commission uh, when we heard from the community, like modulation felt like it came up over and over and Max height, especially knowing that you know they and Melbourne could just build something taller, feels like not as key a priority to have first on the list. So I, I would love to see modulation on the list of priorities. Uh, and for trade offs, um, number one on the list was increased density. Um, wonder about uh, as that's explored. Like finding a way to preserve the intent of you know giving development flexibility, but also not creating like enormous boxes and six hundred square foot apartment complexes. So, um, my personal feeling is as much as possible that the menu incentives could encourage modular apartments of varying sizes, but don't become these like monoliths. My example always is the Mount View or San Antonio and El Camino. There's like four 10 story rectangle, just monolithic apartment complexes. Like, not that. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's have something that is uh, incentivizes on our menu stuff that has more curbial, uh, has more modularity. Um, just just, just to keep it down. Um, also aligned on the city's recommendation to have the uh, map apply citywide it's a big town it makes sense to me to not make our already complicated zoning um, more complicated and then thank you for your answer to my question about um, the menu per density and I do think some degree of like the per density adjustment could be helpful with like why the menu incentives to be offered to Dense property versus like the smaller. Um, thank you. Uh, Christian Craig. 
Yeah, yeah, I pretty much agree with, with most of what Mr. Field said. I, I, I have you know, read the report a couple times. It was a lot to it was a lot to digest, but it was really pretty well done. I definitely side with the staff's recommendations on questions one and three. Uh, make it complimentary. The state law already has so many things on it, and uh, yeah, affordable housing overlay zone should be citywide, other than single family homes, of course. So uh, I think uh, I agree with the staff recommendation on those two items without question. Uh, the devil in the details on number two. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't know yet. We're trying to get affordable housing actually built and it's just a tough, tough time. I uh, I was trying to remember, you know, those, those conversations we had, those many, many conversations. Uh, and I think the 75 foot height limit is really important in a lot of areas and maybe in all the three areas that we noted in terms of the reuse uh, zones, the uh, east of downtown, the uh, area between Prune Yard and, down, and downtown. And then the, the area I was most debating mentally was the uh, west, the south Winchester area. But I think that's another area where the 75 foot height limit would really be embraced by, I, mean, can't, I can't, I can't speak for everybody, it would be embraced by Mike Cray, and I think it would be embraced by the city council and by the people of Campbell. Uh, but there's other areas where, you know, for for the trade-off of, of a really solid number of low market rate housing units, we can, we could go higher. You know, I, for example, the Fry site, you know, just comes to mind, obviously, and I, I definitely agree with what Commissioner Sister was saying, that we did, we're going to need a, a good supply of 100% affordable housing projects, uh, those are tough to get. But uh, in terms of the incentives that, you know, I, yeah, I would like to look at, you know, more density for more BMR. Uh, I think that's, I think that, I think those trade-offs would work. And I think they'd actually work for above the 75 foot height limit in certain locations, uh, certain very limited locations. Uh, you know, we talk about some of the other stuff, like I said, I think is pretty minor, you know, the underground and utilities, which we never do, the parking, the way that this is evolving, the parking is really going to be the developers deciding what makes their projects work, and that's the amount of parking that'll be put in. So I don't know how many, how much we could give them incentive-wise there. Um, and you know, the fees. I, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a little leery. We don't want to get in, in, in financial trouble. Campbell's been so good financially, and we want to stay that way. But you know, we give them a break. But I do agree with. Uh, Commissioner Bookbinder, the ministerial permits on some of these uh, approvals on some of these, I think would be a huge deal for some of these developers. And I think we could get there. And I think we're getting there. And I think I think the, the staff report did spell out a lot of, lot of good stuff. I, I, I like the, uh, really like that report that, that went through all the other cities. Uh, interesting what Menlo Park is doing. I do think it's pretty applicable to us. Uh, you know, and Milpitas and Tiburon and all the other cities. So uh, everybody's, everybody's trying to deal with this and we're all, trying to to get more affordable housing built and it's really hard as we all know uh, the one the one area I would say this is not a, on our agenda for you know where we're really where we're really dropping the ball the state dropped the ball and now the cities are all dropping the ball is in explaining to the to the people to the people of your city why you need the higher density to get the low market rate housing People are just up in arms. Oh, another big high rise is going, another big high density. Oh my God, where's all the traffic gonna go? You know, people don't wanna ride their bikes to work. We, we really, I think, and I know it's one of our economic development items, but uh, I think we gotta, you know, I think the city of Campbell and, and every city in our county has to do a much better job of explaining why we're doing this stuff and why it has to be done. So that's my three cents, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement with a lot of what uh, the commissioners have said. I, I, I support a complementary methodology. Um, it makes sense to me. Um, the, the, max, the max height thing, I mean, I think that, you know, my, 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 my general feeling about maximum height is I think we can go, we can go higher in a lot of places. And, um, uh, I think there's a caveat. I think there's a caveat about setbacks. Um, you can go uh, really high on some of the corridors as long as 
as long as we have some way of dealing with um, setbacks from residential areas. You know, uh, uh, a lot of our corridors butt up against, um, right up against a residential area that are, are one or two story homes. And if you put a, it's not to say you can't put a 10 or 12 foot, a 10 or 12 story building uh, there. Um, but um, but it, 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 the, the impact to the, uh, the adjacent residential area would be of concern to me in, in those instances. It would be much better, obviously, if you, you could keep it down to the, you know, six or eight story kind of level. Um, but we have, as, as, as Commissioner McBinder has often mentioned, is we, we do have a, a 12 story um, uh, building in the, Wesley Manor. Wesley Manor. So uh, at, at Hamilton and, and Winchester. Um, the, the one caveat about that, though, Adam, is that if you look at the surrounding, what surrounds it is that it, it has a, a huge setback from uh, residential areas. It's, it's, um, it's on one side is, 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 a, is a major corridor. On another side, there's a commercial area. On another side, there's a a church, and then the last, the back side, there's a there's a huge setback to um, actually multi multi unit apartment houses. So so it's not it's not overshadowing a single family home residence. So it actually makes perfect sense to be there. And I, I think there's plenty of other places that a, that a building that tall could be um, in in Campbell. So I I think. Um, you know, I don't want to see it. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to see an example of that thing that they, they said they were going to do in San Francisco on the on, at the Pacific uh, side. Of the, I don't know if anybody saw that, where it's over. It's over uh, off of uh, off of the Pacific Coast Highway on the west side of town, where it's all it's all low slung single family homes, and somebody was going to put in a a forty or fifty story uh, skyscraper. <laughs> Supposedly, and I don't know if it was a joke uh, uh, for real, but but it, it, it it's 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 really totally silly. Kind but, of both. What? It was kind of both. It was kind of both. So so um, but you you know I, again, I think there's certain places on our corridors, especially on our corridors, where taller buildings um, can be um, can be suitable and 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 meet. And, and help us meet our needs. So, um, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I think the one, you know, one exception for height is 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 downtown. I would like to maintain the downtown because uh, it's such it's 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 the centerpiece of our city, um, the quaintness of our city, and, and and raising heights in downtown to me is is a prob is problematic. Um, uh, I think we should go citywide on this. Uh, I think the only question about the fees, like uh, Commissioner uh, Cray said, is well, how it impacts our budget. I don't know if the fees are, are that we would normally get gain from if we were to let uh, waive all the fees, whether that would impact our budget. Uh, obviously, an analysis that has to be made. But if it's if it's a relatively small number, um, then. Then, and, that, and that's a true incentive uh, to developers, and then that's what we should be doing. And the only other thing I had was on the list of, of incentives, um, permitting developers to select the location type of BMR housing units in their projects. I, I would be opposed to that. Um, it, the presently state law says, says that it should be distributed uh, uh, around the development, right? Um, so that you, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the first time I ran into that was the uh, Oxnard, is that Oxnard Street? It's the one down by 85 where there's 28 uh, Zuri in my career here. Um, uh, the development that's being developed uh, at, at 85 in Basco. Oh, Basco. the Mozart Avenue. Mozart, Mozart, not Oxnard, Mozart Avenue. So, so they have, uh, like 28 very, fairly expensive uh, 
families, uh, single family homes. It's own, own private little park. And they're putting in three, two or three um, below market rate units. And they have to be typical of the rest of the units in terms of, of size and style and be distributed. And that makes perfect sense to me. Um, I don't think you want to have a big development and then you have all the low-end low, low end people over there, okay? Um, uh, I, I think that, that has, a, has a societal implication. That's not what we're trying to do there. I mean, what, what we're trying to do is, is you know, with BMR is, is allow people to, to be in places where they normally can't afford them. And, uh, and and kind of integrate the world. So uh, I would be I would be opposed to that particular one. Uh, so that would to me we we, we should cross that one. We should just go with the state law on that one. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Um, I forgot a question earlier. I'm sorry. This is for the city attorney. Uh, does AB four ninety one of twenty twenty one preclude us from allowing clustering of BMR units? Um, I don't expect you to know that off the top of your head, but I looked it up. Uh, it says a mixed income multifamily structure shall not isolate the affordable housing units within that structure to a specific floor or an area on a specific floor. It's called the four door bill. It was uh, about two years ago. I think that we may not be able to do that. I, I do know developments have been done, so I don't know exactly how we find about it. I, I think it's, if you could read it, Again, I think sure. that, that prohibits you from isolating them to a particular floor or a area on a specific floor. Right. And I think in the circumstances that I'm aware of, they've tended to concentrate them in a particular unit type within the development. So it's a you know, mixed product environment where you have an apartment building and townhomes. If dispersed them equitably amongst the apartment building, but not necessarily amongst the for sale market rate townhome product. So I would have to review it in greater detail, obviously, but um, I, I guess, guess we have as to tread carefully with app that. Yeah, application of it, especially in use of even state density bonus law to kind of circumvent some of those requirements at times, so. I don't have an answer for you right that, That's okay, I just wanted to raise it as a as an issue, it's a AB 491 in 2021. Um, I agree with everybody else that a complementary approach seems better. Um, it looks like uh, attempts to use a competitive approach just have fallen flat in places that have tried it. And it seems like a lot of work for something that's just gonna get it going. Um, I, I think it might be worthwhile to have different approaches in walkable and non-walkable areas. We went to the trouble of already splitting the city into walkable and non-walkable, and we might have different goals for those places. Um, um, I would I would actually ask like an incentive might be to lower the affordability requirements, which would make more projects pencil. Um, let's see. Uh, just for context, um, when the height limit was passed 37 years ago, the vote was I, I looked this up. The vote was 50.9 percent to 49.1 percent. It passed by a margin of about 200 votes. Is Measure N in 1986, and I will quote from uh, from the City Council. Uh, sorry, the uh, Planning Commission meeting where it was discussed. For example, Wesley Manor will continue to upset the balance of its neighborhood until other tall buildings are built nearby. It is 37 years later. There are no new tall buildings next to it. Um, it remains the only tall building anywhere near that intersection. The balance remains upset. Um, let's see. Um, I, th I think the main thing we should focus on here is getting things built. Like obviously um, properly using our own resources, uh, especially since the city's funding is very limited for this kind of thing is, is a priority. But like, I don't think we're in danger of being overrun by cookie cutter buildings. Like the danger we have is that dirt lot that the city delayed getting a project dealt with until I think the financing fell through and maybe the Cresley is going to build it. Maybe it's not, but it's currently a dirt lot. Like that's, that's the alternative. Um, in terms of increasing um, BMR percentages, uh, 
Um, like I would rather have 15% of 100 than 30% of nothing. And that, that's like a real problem. You get if you bump up the affordable percentages because like, um, San Francisco did that and they had a lot fewer projects could be financed. I'd be really cautious about doing that. Um, I understand that uh, there's a lot of concern about articulation and height, but I think our first priority should be hitting our numbers. Um, it's an affordable housing overlay zone. We should try and produce affordable housing. Um, so we could, in theory, get our BMR numbers by just making a lot of market rate housing with a smaller inclusionary percentage. That probably wouldn't multiply out without making a lot more housing. And we would probably want to make things more appealing for a 100% um, affordable developer. Um, with that, like I, I really encourage, I think um, ministerial approval has got to be one of the most powerful things we can offer. Um, I think it's a really, really good idea. And that would probably make, because I know, especially with 100% affordable housing, the timeline is really, they have to line up a whole bunch of things. And if they don't have to wait for city permitting, they don't have to go through a discretionary process. They can just get it approved. This is part of why SB 35 has been so useful is that it gets you um, a buy right permitting. Um, so I, I really encourage that to be like the main incentive that we offer. Um, I think that covers, every, oh, and uh, yeah, I, I agree. It should apply to all everything except for R1, which will be covered by other programs. If we split, we should be walkable and non, but I, I definitely don't think we should have another map with complicated um, slice, everything sliced into tiny, tiny pieces. Um, to the extent that we can keep it simple and universal, we should keep it simple and universal for the city. And those are my opinions. Can I just sure. comment? Yeah, I just I just want to be clear. I, I agree with you on the, on the you know the um, the, the um, for profit developers, uh, market rate developers, you know, pushing them higher on on affordability is. Yeah, you know, I, I think the fifteen percent. I'm only speculating, but I think the 15% probably came about because they did the numbers and they negotiated with developers. The developers said, if we get this much density more, we can handle 15%. That's probably, whenever that was done, that's probably how it came about. Um, but what my emphasis is that we got to get people who are trying to make profit, right? We got to get the uh, mid peninsulas in the uh, abodes. The other nonprofit guys to uh, take a real hard look at Campbell. Now, our problem is we don't have, we got two properties. <laughs> we got two sites. <laughs> so we got we got we got to figure out some way of finding more sites. So this applies to the whole city. This doesn't just apply to our opportunity sites. No, but not, what I'm saying for nonprofits, usually the way Nonprofits are encouraged. Oh, to the city donated sites. Yeah, the city donates sites. So, so if there, I don't know what other ways there are, unless there's money somewhere that we can, you know, ask Google. Hey, how about Facebook? If, um, <laughs> if SB four gets passed, um, uh, so that that's that's, that's my plan. That. Uh, so we, we have to look. We have to look at that. Yeah, and to in that, a big way. To that end. You know, we could offer extra incentives for 100% uh, VMR developers or for nonprofit developers. I'm not sure if we can split it by profit, nonprofit, but certainly um, more generous incentives for I, state density bonus law already does that, but we go above and beyond some, some I guess, especially the thing with being able to waive park and load fees for, um, for BMR units, which sounds like a pretty reasonable thing to do. I know that we, Need money for parks, but if that would help incentivize things, especially you know to make our program look better. But honestly, I think that um, I think that ministerial permitting will be like a huge plus. All right? Does anybody have anything else to add? All right? Uh, does staff feel like they got enough? Yes. Congratulations! You got through part one. <laughs> uh, part two and three are kind of together. Part two and three are combined. So. Yeah. Do you feel like take a break or if not, Stephen? Can you read for about three minutes? Sure. Uh, we will reconvene in uh, at forty-seven past or. 40
All right. So as mentioned before the break, uh, we're moving on to part two. We've luckily combined part two with part three. And at the, at the conclusion of which we'll stop for public comment and we'll to questions and feedback from the commission. So the, uh, the first uh, section where we cover is the reuse overlay. Um, so this is a the state law essentially requires the city to establish a by right or ministerial permit process for any sites, a number of sites in the city reused from prior housing elements when at least 20% of the housing units are made affordable to lower income households. Specifically, the reuse site inventory needs to include non vacant sites, which were used in the prior housing element, and vacant sites from two or more consecutive planning periods. So, in total, there's 60 sites that fall into the reuse overlay, one of which is a, a, a vacant site, not that it makes a substantive difference at this point. Uh, there is no discretion for the city in the selection or identification at this point as to which sites are included in the reuse overlay. So staff will be uh, proceeding with uh, a mapping layer to indicate that these are going to be the sites we see reflected here on the bottom right will be included in the city's reuse overlay and create a uh, corresponding text amendment to our zoning ordinance to implement the same. So on this particular section, the staff is just simply recognize, uh, recommending that the planning commission acknowledge the requirement. But as part of part three, um, separately consider these sites, which have been included in the, in the uh, reuse overlay, as possible sites for overlap, and, and where we do have a little bit more discretion in the buy right overlay, which I'll talk about next. So uh, the city, so the third overlay, which we have for discussion tonight, um, is, is largely a consequence for the city of not meeting its compliance deadline of January 31st, 2023 to have not only an adopted housing element, but one that's also been certified by a city. Uh, as just a general note, there had not been a single city in Santa Clara County which met the compliance deadline. So we weren't alone. Uh, as a result of not meeting the compliance deadline, the city was required to include a program, uh, program H3E from the housing element, which requires the city to rezone for lower income housing shortfall which essentially allows for a by right permit processing of the city's regional housing uh, needs shortfall. It's a little bit complicated how you get there. Uh, we have a table here on the screen which is showing the math. Broadly speaking, you take the, the, the city's obligation to the six cycle arena in both a very low and low income housing category. That's your, that's your starting point. From that, you subtract uh, the anticipated production of ADU units, pipeline projects, and site support supporting low-income housing based on their uh, HCD math and what's assumed to be to support uh, affordable housing is generally sites which have at least a density of 30 units per acre. But under a prior general plan and housing element, we didn't support that, so we didn't have any sites that met that obligation. And as a result, you come up with a total of 1,024 units, which the city needs to plan for adequate sites to, to accommodate by right or ministerial processing thereof. So in the, in the buy right housing overlay, uh, again, the city has to allow for buy right permit processing. It's not for all projects, but when they do uh, provide at least 20% of those units, they make them uh, affordable to lower income households. Uh, the city also has to permit exclusively residential units, which means that if a developer of their own option chose to, of their own elect were to build an exclusively residential project, they could do so. And when, whenever a, a mixed use project is built within the buy right housing overlay, uh, at least 50% of the floor area of that project has to be dedicated to, the, to a residential component. So you can't do a token amount of um, residential or largely um, a commercial mixed use project. It also requires the city to provide uh, a combined capacity. So once you've identified those sites, which are gonna be included in the, in the buy right housing overlay, combined all the media add up to the regional to, to our, our, our lower income housing shortfall that's that 1024 units mentioned previously now in selecting sites there's uh, just really two rules um, you can only select sites that support at least 16 dwelling units you can't just pick like single family homes to meet the obligation for single family sites and they have to have a, a density of at least 30 units to the acre so uh, just to kind of frame up this section um, 
similar to the the for the affordable housing overlay zone, we have several key policy uh, decisions to consider. Um, the first is: is it important for the city to protect uh, those areas which are mixed use or that require have it, that include a mixed use requirement, or to minimize the number of sites which are going to now be subject to a, a ministerial or by right permit process? So these are kind of ways of framing the options which we present in the report, because this is a key consideration in which of those options might be preferred. The second question is, where is it most important for the city to retain its, its, uh, its uh, discretionary review, I should say, rather than by right review? So if we want to retain the discretionary permit process, is it more important that we preserve that option in single family neighborhoods where neighbors might come out and want to comment on an application that might no longer be an option, or particular sites of community significance. This could be your, your Fry's Electronics, your Pruning Yard. When those projects come forward, the housing development project, there'll be larger, denser projects, which will be visible to every member of our community. So that's a, a key consideration as well. So with that, in the report, we presented really three, three different approaches or options that may be considered. Uh, the first is to try to maximize the, the reuse site inventory. So the sites which we have to allow for ministerial processing because they're included prior housing elements. So we try to maximize those, but then also select those sites with the highest density, so you see like possibly your fries, possibly your throwing yards. Uh, as a benefit of that, we could we would minimize the sites which may be subject to a buy right permit process. But as a consequence, again, a number of significant projects might not come before the planning commissioner council for review. Um, it would also impact a, a greater number of mixed use sites. This, again, some of those sites which I've mentioned, like fries and like the brewing yard, would otherwise be required to have a mixed use component, which would no longer be required. Uh, as an alternative, just really flip side of the same, instead of pursuing the highest density sites, the city can pursue uh, a, a, some of the lower density sites to meet the obligation requirements. This could result in sites in near to single family residential neighborhoods or residential neighborhoods allowing for by right permit processing so they wouldn't really have the opportunity to comment on it. Examples may include, say, like Llewellyn or Virginia projects, uh, which we recently received and I think had pre applications at some point without introducing comments or comments on those. Um, and, and again, some of the sites do also require mixed use less so than the first category, but there would be an impact there. Uh, as, a, as an alternative, another alternative that the city may, uh, may consider, instead of focusing on high density, low density sites, or even the reuse inventory, trying to maintain as much discretionary authority as we can, we could see, simply seek to try to protect those areas of the city which have a mixed use ground floor requirement by not including those within this by right housing overlay. Uh, we have demonstrated how under one approach or one set of sites selected that nearly all sites with a mixed use requirement could be avoided uh, with the exception of one and uh, broadly speaking mixed use it, it just it's more than just providing a, a a retail sales tax base on the ground floor it does lend to a community image of the site uh, it does uh, provide for uh, access to amenities. I mean, it, it was a big discussion point, as I recall, in the general plan and housing element, that there had, there had been a particular site, the, the milk farm dairy site in Santa Moss area, that we wanted to preserve a mixed use component in that area because it provided a resource to individuals in it, uh, that would be seeking a, a community resource. Something to consider as well. But as a con, uh, obviously, as a flip side of the other two, this third option would not try to maximize our reuse sites, and as a result, more sites would be subject to uh, a by right or ministerial permit process that would otherwise be obligated by the city. Is this specific to the actual proposal to sites to attach this permit? I believe that's the previous section, the ones that we have to um, mark as, obviously, we're in the previous. Um, Housing elements and they weren't developed. Yeah, so the sites you're seeing depicted here on the screen, so these are those sites which were either included in the prior housing element, which were a non vacant site, or in the case of, I think, one property on the element, uh, used in two or more consecutive planning periods and had vacant. So these are the, those are locked in. These are going to be subject to a buy right permit process. But 20% or more of those units are made affordable to lower income household, households. 
by comparison, the, the buy right housing overlay, we have greater discretion of picking exactly which sites we want to include. Try to overlap those to the greatest extent feasible, or you could try to meet other policy objectives like avoiding next two sites. So that, that really brings us to the conclusion of this section. Um, we're going to stop for public comment first. And uh, then we'll open it for questions. And <laughs> All right, I'll open the public hearing. It's going to be in the room. Is anyone online? Close public hearing. Okay, uh, let's go to the same order as before. Question, round of questions, then round of feedback. Um, 100% figure out how to make this question. Try. Uh, it's the thing we're biasing on for decision making. Passing this overlay now, granting us the control. Like, the, the question I have is if eight years from now we don't get this housing built, is that like a larger problem than just being compliant today? Um, like, is there, is there any reason? Different map. I think it's just more likely it will result in affordable houses being built than if we choose this one that maybe gives us the most discretion on these major properties that we prevent it. Basically, like, I just don't know are we trying to make this choice today on the basis of our discretion, or should we try and make the choice based on what do we think is most likely going to generate? Affordable housing down the road. Well, I, 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 I don't do. know what my question is, but like it's it's in this space of like I just don't understand what is the main principle we're trying to make. Uh, yeah, so let me help. I can try and help you frame it. Thank uh, you. <laughs> so if we do go back to the housing element and we started, I mean, we did hear sort of two principles coming out of the city council, which was say do everything you can to help housing come into the city, affordable housing. Number one, number two, we want housing that fits in the camp. And to the extent we need, we need sort of oversight to make sure that happens. A lot, a lot of the objective standards was to make it clear, make it clear on the outset. It's, you know, these are the standards you adhere to. But again, those principles were sort of driving the housing element general plan and objective standards. So I, I guess with this, there is a bit of a trade-off. I mean, you just had a discussion where the discussion was, hey, what can we do that, that helps for housing development? And as Chair Buckliner mentioned, hey, if it's ministerial, uh, it'll go through a lot faster, a lot more affordable housing can be developed. So those having discretionary review and ministerial could, could have some trade-offs. Uh, that being said, I, we know in general, uh, as I think mentioned by Commissioner Craig, folks in the community usually like to know what's happening in their community. They usually want a right to go to a hearing and applying if housing is in their neighborhood. And so if the question here, the, those are trade-offs. Are there areas of the city where they should maintain that the neighbor should be noticed. It's not just a ministerial process for a project that meets that 20% affordable. I think the last point, I think you're hanging out, might have gotten wrong, Davis, was if we don't produce enough affordable housing, is there worse trade offs ahead? I can't think of any now. Camel, as with any other city, hasn't met its renew requirements, and thus we're subject to things like SB 35. If at some point in the future we build enough housing uh, to meet our arena, if there are actually more protections for discretionary review. But I don't think at this point, or Stephen might know this, uh, there are fewer further penalties at this point for continuing on the path we've continued on already. That makes sense. Um, for the major sites, talk about the Permanent negative price, for example. Um, what are we What are we saying? That's something that goes in front of planning commission because it is a like potentially multifamily development, or like what? Say. So, as of present, so we established new permitting process and procedures as part of our housing development uh, projects ordinance. And uh, projects which are under, I think it's five units, are decided upon by the community development director over five units is the planning commission. So generally, even Fry's Electronics, when it comes forward, would be 
really decided upon by the planning commission except on appeal to the city council. Um, the exception being, of course, sites which are over five acres, which happens to be Fry's Electronics would meet that qualification, which go to council for a decision. So not to say both, but just effectively those are the threshold. So up to five, five to infinite, with the exception of when you have five acres or more, those are the clear permit thresholds. So what we'd be largely doing is giving that up. Instead of this process, these projects going to a public hearing process where the public can comment and let the developer know their thoughts and feelings on a particular project and provide feedback, which could then help them form conditions of approval imposed on a project. These projects would essentially be subject to a checklist. They meet the checklist of objective requirements. They pass right through the zoning clearance process and then subsequently submit for a building permit or uh, issuance. So the first time, uh, well, other than if the city were to do a courtesy review noticing process, first time when some, some members of the public will hear about a project would be when they start seeing, seeing hammer swung and, and the project going vertical. That makes sense. Um, my last one, and I'm delving back in the hypotheticals. Let's say we do this overlay. We have a compliant plan here. Flash forward like eight years and nobody builds enough units. Like what is the, what is the, do we just stay in our current state in terms of like maybe the penalties we're in in terms of restrictions we can offer? Like what is that? But what happens if eight years from now we haven't built enough units? Well, whatever, I'm saying, I'm saying eight years, what is the date of compliance we're looking at for this Yeah, so 20, our 2023 to 2031 is our housing element. Six cycle overview period. Um, in this last regional housing needs allocation cycle, they did not assign, say, at, at this proportion, the number of housing units based on a failure to meet a prior housing on the cycle does not mean that won't be part of the methodology on the next assignment, right? Uh, to to uh, Director Eastwood's prior comment, I mean, we are already subject to SB 35 provisions we wouldn't otherwise be subject to if the city was meeting or exceeding its regional housing needs allocation. So you're already seeing a consequence of not meeting a, a regional housing needs allocation. That's it. I'd broadly say that these tools that you're seeing before you, the reuse overlay and the buy right housing overlay, there's a number of different ways the city could try to incentivize or build or provide for affordable housing and meet its regional housing needs allocations. These are very specific purpose driven overlays, which are intended to meet very clear statutory state law requirements. I wouldn't try, I wouldn't necessarily recommend trying to use these as tools necessarily to go outside that because they could confuse the legal requirements with the city's separate objectives or other program intents. Uh, as previously mentioned, the housing element includes over 100 and something 30 different, different programs. You're, you're seeing only three of them tonight. There's more to come. And you may feel differently once these projects start coming, exactly how you might want to curate and control certain aspects of projects. And let's just see how these play out as well. Uh, that was very clarifying. Thank you. Mr. Craig? Yes, yes, Stephen. Thanks for all this. I just, just to clarify again, so uh, we have to do a buy right overlay. So that's required. Correct. So okay. both, both of these overlays you're seeing before you, the reuse and the buy right, are both mandatory programs. Okay. Yeah, another reuse one. Okay. And that's, that's why it's so hard. <laughs> you know, I hate that first question with the or. Of the word and you know it's kind of like they're both important uh, eventually, but uh, let's get more into discussion than questions. So I, I don't think I have any questions. Thanks. So I'm a little dense on this. This whole by right thing is always so. Could you first of all explain to me about about retaining by right review. What is that? Yeah, I should probably correct the slide while we're on it. Um, it's, it's really retaining discretionary review is what we're aiming to do. Um, let me go ahead and share. That was a, that was a typo on the particular slide. Steven's doing that in the commissioner's history. So where should the city maintain? A housing project has to go through a process where it goes for a hearing and you have the right 
I had been installing. We have less yes. right, versus the ministerial process where it goes through staff, looks at it only, not necessarily people will be noticed, permits will be issued. And so the, the by right review is the ministerial review? Right, yes. one thing. Okay. okay. So these are the two questions you're asking us. Uh, is it more important to uh, minimize? Yeah. So, um, um, and I guess my question about the mixed use is is that are, are we are you asking us to um, tell, uh, give you our position on 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 how important it is to to uh, insist on mixed use whenever possible? Is that what you know? I, I mean, we used to do it a lot, right? I and mean, it was like uh, if it's if it's if it's on this in this location it's got mixed use that that's changed uh, i i guess that requirement is it has changed or uh, or we're looking at, at changing uh, that requirement so that uh, they people uh, developers can build a development without mixed use yeah in, in areas where we would normally wanted to expect Understood. Maybe if I ref so it's kind of the, the problem statement which the buy right housing overlay is trying to solve. The city has to find at least a sufficient number of sites to allow for the buy right or ministerial review process of 1,024 units. So what's being posed as a, as a prompt is in it's kind of coming down to principles. Which in what is the methodology that staff should be using to go about deciding which sites are the are the best to be included. We presented in the report three different approaches that may be taken. I've, those are kind of being synthesized down to these kind of two um, key policy calls being asked for on the screen that will help guide us as staff so that when we come back with actual sites selected, those sites which we've selected best reflect the, the goals or the priorities of the commission. So one approach would be to say, hey, we want to preserve and protect wherever we've retained a ground floor, say, commercial component, mixed use requirement. So try to avoid those sites. And it's more important to us to avoid those sites than it is for us to try to retain, a, say, a public hearing process. So those projects could go through a staff level review process, still retaining the requirement for a mixed use requirement, but not be subject to a public hearing. So I, I guess I guess my uh, uh, my question is I guess the question then arises is you, you say you have a potential uh, you have a potential development and it could easily be a ministerial easily be a ministerial thing where you could say that, that's fine and and yet yet it it's it's in a location where if we had our druthers, we'd want it to be mixed use, but the developer doesn't want it to be mixed use. Um, uh, where does that leave you from a ministerial point of view? Do you say, I mean, do you have the authority to say, no, it's gonna be mixed use? It's an objective requirement. So the project would be compelled to comply with it unless it met unless it was pursuing a state density bonus law and using other concessions or waivers to alleviate the requirement or in the event it was placed within this new buy right housing overlay we're discussing it met a minimum 20 percent affordable low provided set aside 20 percent of the units to lower income households so if it's in the overlay they could alleviate themselves of that requirement without even being a density bonus project granted if they're doing 20 percent affordable they're probably going to be doing that anyways but uh, that's beside the point. <laughs> and if we decide that it's more important to protect mixed use requirements, that basically means it's going to come to us and then we're going to make a decision on some uh, on that kind of example rather than you making the decision and staff. You no, know, we're kind of deciding up front um, 
zone, the area, so the specific sites to include, which we would then be alleviating from a mixed use requirement. Now, right. So we would get down to that detail. Here. Or we, right now, we're just looking for general direction, which is kind of why right. we had restructured the, this could bring it back down to principles. Okay. So right. Right. Individual sites, based on the feedback to provide us, we'll be returning to the map, which okay. we think best reflects your time. Um, I didn't have any particular questions. Um, what's your notes? Uh, I think staff is getting this right. I think option three makes sense to preserve our ability to weigh in on the most preeminent properties in the town. Um, and the other two maps that were presented, I think, sort of bypass that and just again, judging from the commentary I've seen or public interest, the one I believe the public would want us to do is preserve the ability to weigh in on those, um, particularly like ones centered around like gateway entrances to the city, prize, Um So uh, to me, option three made sense. And um, I guess just to your question, it's aligned with the question, but like, Preserving mixed use, uh, particularly in these like mega developments, I think, uh, if at all possible, is is a good thing to focus on. Um, just to have sort of a vibrant uh, development, and again, you've heard me say it before, just avoid these big monoliths next to concrete with nothing else going on. Um, that I hope we can avoid. Um, that's it. I agree uh, with uh, Commissioner Davis, uh, and I think yeah, thanks for that answer to Commissioner Zisser's question, uh, Stephen. That did help me put it in perspective too. But yeah, I think definitely think uh, three is the, the 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 best way to go. And I you know don't need me to say it, but it, we definitely don't want to ever approve something that would allow a fry site to just get ministerial permit. Obviously, you know I you know the city council, of course, wouldn't go for that. And I don't want to speak for them, but. Uh, as Commissioner Davis was just saying, you know, with the, the big major sites, obviously, we need to need to lean on that. And on the other hand, oh, what Commissioner Bookbinder especially has said, we've all said that the ministerial permits are, are a good setup overall. So, um, you know, that certainly makes sense in a lot of uh, situations. And with the state law and our laws now, there is a lot of cases where certainly ministerial permits will certainly suffice. So, thanks. Yeah, I, I think I agree too. I, I'm, um, you know, I, I think that um, there's an awful lot of, you know, places where we, we, we like to think that mixed use makes sense, but it's not necessarily, it could live without it. I mean, I think there are places where um, there's a, you know, where, where uh, I make the example of the Campbell Plaza shopping center, obviously, whatever, if, if something happens there, um, depending on what it is, I mean, it, it, it could conceivably, if, if they were keeping part of the shopping center, and then putting in some residential in the back or on the side, if you've already got commercial, maybe you don't need commercial in that building. So, I mean, it, there's a possibility that it could be mixed use or not mixed use. Um, but that's obviously the most likely because it, it is a, what I, what I consider kind of a district. Uh, if we have, we have districts in Campbell and that's one of them, um, you know, like, like, like Kirkwood Plaza and like Prune Yard and downtown. So, so that, that's to me a, a commercial district and, and with, with nearby residential where people can gather. And so, so it, obviously someplace like that where we would want to be able to determine whether it would make sense to um, have mixed use, uh, uh, I think we should have 
that opportunity to do that. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, even as an example, actually an opposite example is across the street, we have on the map the, um, the nursery. I think that's the nursery. Um, I, I could argue that that doesn't need to be mixed use, even though it's across the street, because we've already got plenty of retail. And that could just be a big residential building. Um, so, so uh, you know, it, it, it depends on one's perspective. But, but, uh, and 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 there's um, there's uh, there's other plenty of other examples where um, it looks like it would make sense to have mixed use, but maybe maybe considering the importance of the overriding importance of putting up residential. Is uh, it, uh, is uh, you know overrides the mixed use, thing. but I, I still believe that we should have uh, the opportunity to weigh in on that. So I would I would agree with the other commissioners in that respect, um, and I would look forward to seeing more detail in the future and being able to you know, be able to. Uh, Get more specific on, on sites. So I have. Thank you. Uh, I concur with everyone else. Option three seems like the best idea. I don't see a ministerial review as being a downside. Ministerial review means more housing produced, which is what we're all trying to shoot for. Uh, more broadly, I don't think it improves these projects when people want to protest them. Um, to be honest, neighbors do not show up en masse to support low market rate housing. Um, and noting that if we're concerned that the fries uh, would get ministerial review, we have, you know, objective standards to express what we want. And if we put forward the our own uh, affordable housing overlay, they might just use, as noted, might just use the ministerial uh, review option through there if we decide to provide it, which I think we should. Um, yeah, it, I think definitely we went through a lot to talk about during the general plan process about how we want to do mixed use. So I think being able to protect those requirements is definitely more important than trying to maximize the amount of discretion that the city can still have. I went to, to a lot of trouble to make sure that the city's will could be expressed in objective ways, and I think we should trust that. That's my opinion. Uh, do you have what you need from the commission? Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, just an FYI, I think Stephen has some screen. Just go to city council next week. Stephen's not going to spend all my minutes to report, but as we finish the report tomorrow, read this into the council report. And again, uh, your recommendations will be presented to the council next week when they hear something. Thank you for all your work. Yeah, thanks a lot. Oh, and thanks, thanks to. Um, uh, Ms. Meek, the intern who did the uh, yes. review, that was very impressive. Forward our thanks. Okay, so I believe we have next on the agenda is uh, ad hoc committee updates. We are done with that too. We're all done. Okay. Uh, item three, ad hoc subcommittee discussion. I believe Commissioner Fields has a PowerPoint presentation. Really? Fancy. Nancier than I am right now. We set it high standard. <laughs> you did. Uh, just a couple slides. Um, so the goal of today is to give you a quick overview, consider this a preview of what I think we'll spend a lot more time on in two weeks. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, just to recap what we're trying to do here with the economic development subcommittee. Streamline permitting for land uses. There's 186 of them. Today they're permitted, conditionally permitted, prohibited, a couple cases administrative. They're applied across our five zones. And in order to put together, uh, Commissioner Campcar and I, along with city staff, we looked at the last 10 years of conditional use permits. We looked at what other local cities are requiring. We talked to local businesses and city staff to put together a set of recommendations. Um, Go to the next slide. The new thing we haven't showed you before is just the guiding principles that we want to pass.
pass on to the city council as well of explaining what are we doing here. Um, I think the number one is just sort of defining like what did we get involved in, like why there were 186 permits, we're not updating all of them, why did we pick the ones picked? Uh, you can see the first bullet again just talks about what are we seeing, like on the ground in these planning commission meetings, what's been coming in front of us that really resulted in you know uncontroversial unanimous approvals. Those really informed uh, you know the initial set that we looked at. We also have looked at the city's broader economic development plans to see you know, what kind of businesses is that encouraging that we streamline and support. And then finally, just seeing like okay, we're bordered by you know, a bunch of other towns. If we are the odd man out, having this stringent requirement, like is there actually a good reason? Is this something we could streamline if you know down the block there is a music store and for some reason we're prohibiting it? Why are we? Um, what there's a couple instances and we'll talk about one of them today where we're not touching something right now if we think there's like something we should do long term. Um, so uh, we'll talk about wireless telecommunication in a second, but what I think is good is we're doing this update this year, you know, we've been busy this uh, over time. The third thing that we're doing, uh, and I think this was very by design, we're trying to avoid including something that is like a voice pill or super controversial in the set. I think if we just do the set we're proposing, we'll streamline the most popular cases for not only developers, but also citizens of companies forum. Uh, we will make things more efficient for the planning commission, for city staff, and there's lots of benefits. We're not trying to touch like third rail issues like downtown sort of alcohol obviously has attracted a lot of commentary. Uh, the other one that I had initially proposed was wireless telecommunications staff recommended. Uh, we probably should do a more thorough update given the constituents and certain nuance there, which I'm comfortable with. Um, massage is another good example. We got some retail feedback that the city could be more open to this, but I think in general that has been a touchy subject. Um, and so that's another one we're just not. <laughs> <It was kind. laughs> so that's just not what we're touching here. I mean, in general, we have plenty of touching I'm not now you for me. <laughs> uh, we're trying to come in with a set of things uh, that I think will just be broadly popular, efficient updates that you know help us develop the city faster the uses that people want to see. Um, the last thing, and this is like really the new thing, and I, I really appreciate what the staff has done, is they took Commissioner Kampkar and I's input that was sort of obviously not informed by many decades of experience working on municipal code and then used uh, tools to sort of protect the intent. So the next slide did a couple examples of like what did we show up and ask for, and then the column to the right shows, okay, great, how, how would this be actually applied in the municipal code? So go to the next slide, uh, and I apologize for the font, it's a little small. Um, so uh, first item, medical services, for example, so what we came in and said, and we've talked about this one at length, uh, what Commissioner Kipkar and I said is, hey, this is the number four most approved condition use permit. These have always been popular. Uh, we heard from multiple retail brokers. This is a popular Bay Area use. It's unusually hard to do Campbell. So our ask was to streamline the permits in the commercial zone. Um, if you go to the right, you can see the recommendation, which is to permit them by right professional office. Uh, and then there is a nuance here about preserving them by right up to a certain size threshold and then uh, having them sort of located 50 feet away from the right of way uh, and occupying less than 10% of the gross floor. So this, I think, was a great way that they tackled sort of the former concentration problem, which is, you know, if we just streamline the permitting for this, would like Hamilton Plaza suddenly turn into like a dental you know, haven, and I think this will preserve a certain amount of discretion still that'll make sure that we don't all of a sudden like lose the plot on certain complexes. Um, so that's the first example. Uh, the second example is about uh, thrift stores. Uh, if you go over to the left again, 
which again, multiple retail brokers said, uh, said, hey, what's up with this one? Because they were expressly prohibited. Uh, and they were either expressly prohibited or depending on the zone required a conditional use permit. And the retail broker said, why are we doing this? This is a popular use, particularly with younger folks. Uh, why are we making this so hard? And so we came in and said, could we streamline these? Campbell has secondhand thrift stores, they're popular. Uh, and the staff recommendation is to actually sort of condense the uh, item with a different listing. And so basically, if you're operating a secondhand thrift store that doesn't take donations, right, you're treated like a retail store, permitting is streamlined. If you want to open up a donation center, which I do think is in fact like how many people are coming there, parking, other issues, that still retains the CP. So again, I think the staff so we stepped in a great job sort of taking our intent and then crafting something that streamlines the primary input but then preserves discretion on uh, like a large donation center all of a sudden opening up uh, in some of these micro. Uh, two more examples, tutoring centers. Um, this was a staff identified use. Uh, it's aligned with principle number one. Uh, and so this one just permits them by right up to a certain size threshold. Again, I think this is very logical. This is one where you look at the code, you look at our past conditional use permits. We've approved four of these over the past 10 years. This is like a Kumon or you know a very non-controversial use. And for some reason in our code right now, we've just made it hard for people. Again, there's the over-concentration clause. So we won't have a Hamilton Plaza that is purely small tutoring centers. Um, and so, I feel like this is a nice update to the city code. The last one, just to give you an example of something we are not doing per the principle of just having a set of recommendations that should be sort of broadly popular and improve efficiencies, wireless telecommunications facilities. We have covered a lot of these in uh, this forum and had come in and said, hey, why not? This was like our ask, like, why don't we just allow uh, benign updates to be streamlined and new towers to require CPs. And then Stephen spent about 15 minutes telling me some nuances about our municipal code crossed with our zoning and all of the different sort of things that play into just towers. And I think I became convinced this was a suitably dense topic uh, that likely didn't really fit the bill with some of our other asks, like. Um, so I am comfortable with staff's recommendation that this is something we're not trying to, you know, rush through given uh, these towers have attracted some amount of impact. So if you go to the next slide, what we're going to do in two weeks is look at the whole list. Uh, I think there's between 15 and 20 of these and discuss them as a group. You can see what we came up with. Um, if you want to look at the entire set just for fun, uh, shoot me a message and I can send you the big monster list of like all of the uses. Um, yeah. How many are we looking at modifying in this 15, round? 15, 20 of the 180. Okay, so we originally it was four and like it's expanded considerably. The four I showed at the previous meeting were the four most popular of the CUP. And then we, Matt and I sent a subsequent set of about 11 over to the city. And then the city is added you know, four to six to that. So that's how we got up to the number we're at. Right. You said 15 to 20? I think that's right. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll look at that next time. Uh, discuss this group, see how we're feeling. Uh, vote on it. Um, if that passes, that would then go on to city council to be considered as part of the broader economic development proposal. Uh, I think at this point, we voted on it. January, like early 20th. Um, so, if you have any questions on any part of the show, um, I had a couple quick uh, quick thoughts uh, just off the top, which you, I'm sure you, thought, you already thought about staff, but the, uh, in terms of the medical uh, uses and everything, and I know we always approve them, but I, I think the one wrinkle that might come in at times is if there's any. Uh, gases or dangerous substances that the medical use 
might use or, or even medications that they, that they administer or give out. And I think that might get a little tricky. I don't know how you handle that, but it would be so seldom. And, and then the other point that comes to mind in terms of the thrift shops and, uh, and also the tutoring is, I, I don't know, as with liquor establishments, we don't want too many in, in one location. So I guess that would be the same thrift shops. Uh, and then just one quick thought on the, when you said the, the massage, we use the, the massage parlor or massage. I, I guess you just really mean any kind of adult type of use. Is that, or is that getting too So much? doing them in reverse order, there is a, there are two sort of similar uses. There was a use that was about like spa services. And then, I mean, again, I'm not a planner. I think we have a use that was just massage or is massage rolled. Yeah, that's right. So we have a use that is literally just massage, which is not theoretically like adult in nature, but because of uh, sordid history <laughs> is controversial. And that, so we're just saying that one, like we're not, yeah. Uh, for tutoring and medical and some of, Many of the other ones you will see in the list have an over-concentration thing, which is basically like, if you're the first one in a shopping center, you're good. If by adding yourself to the shopping center, all of a sudden 10 to 20% of the shopping center is just this use that triggers more. Um, and then on the medical one, I think, I think the answer to this, you should say it, but like, we're not changing like, like, I believe that medical uses in general have a lot of requirements around gases and waste disposal. We're not doing anything to any of those. It's just purely like if you've met all the other requirements, do you have to show up to the planning commission or not? I think that's is that. Yeah. Well, my question about the medical stuff is that I, I make the assumption before, before it ever gets to us, there are certain you know, if people are getting injections or. <laughs> Case of the dental office, multiple procedures. Case of B12 injections. Um, I see. I see. There's an urgent care facility now in Hamilton Plaza. It's like they must do some stuff there, and, and so I assume that even uh, that that there are certain requirements in the application. They have to prove themselves to have, you know, the right personnel and the right. Um, State, you know, whatever. It sounds like this is stamp of approval for specifically for medical. I'm not just talking about, you know, selling widgets. I'm talking about if you're, if you're injecting people with chemicals. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, my understanding. There, there, there must be, the city must have a, a, few, a process where they ask for certain things, right? Well, it's even way more. So typically, it's not a land use machine. It's a sort of a licensing health right. department, environmental health, state license, restoring you have chemicals, the fire marshal, or officially make you store it properly. All those things are addressed through the licensing process. It's typically not a land. I mean, usually it's a land use tool of like, whoa, is this a use where neighbors will get nervous if it's nearby? Yeah. It's cause noise and traffic issues. So generally all of those happen through licensing. Um, I didn't have any further questions, just as uh, exciting work. Oh, actually, but yeah, I actually did have a question. I'm, I'm yeah. following up with doing parking stuff. I've been looking at the, the four uses that have come up. Um, there haven't been as many parking modification permits as there have been additional use permits, but um, I think it would be reasonable for me, since you have an expanded list, to go back and see what, um, if there are other types of parking permits that would change to make these. Um, this is actually um, ministerial. Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll send you the, the draft list now, so you can look at it in advance. The other thing, it, the slide said, just to make it explicit, I'm also going to send this to the retail brokers now, so that they can see, like, okay, this is how we'd apply it in code. Do they have any feedback or commentary? Because several of them, like, literally, are like representing, you know, the Prune Yard or Hamilton Plaza. So I think that'll be a good chance to get input of like. How does this sort of land with them? Um, okay. yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. That actually, that glides rather well into mine, which is the uh, relevant parking stuff. So, um, Commissioner Campbell, I met with staff 
who uh, were very, very helpful, uh, suggested that we split up restaurant uses. Um, instead of being one big use, the way we define restaurants is not really uh, sensible. Um, the IT suggests splitting it to fast casual quality, high turnover slash sit down, fast food, and coffee or donut shop, which is a different taxonomy that the city uses. Um, staff generally approved of the approach. Uh, it was also suggested that we um, split our standards into applying to walkable and non-walkable areas, kind of like what Los Gatos does. They have standards for downtown and out of downtown. Uh, so I'm currently redoing the analysis to only consider parking modification permits that were granted in walkable but non-AB 2097 areas to see what kind of things we would streamline. Uh, so I've been looking at only four uses, but uh, I'll say the same thing for the others. Um, I expect this will prob probably be, I expected this would be a less invasive change, but given that we're going to be possibly changing the definition of restaurants, uh, that may be a little bit more uh, complicated, but uh, um, I should. Uh, that, that's one that says you can't require parking within a half mile of a planned or existing transit stop. So that, that's like 40% of the city. I was actually kind of surprised that um, not all of the businesses were within that area. But um, so far, the ones I checked were actually within what we define as a walkable area, the ones that were not in the A between 97 areas. So th this, uh, uh, despite A between 97, uh, this still does matter for, for permits. So uh, yeah, I'll be following up on that. Hopefully I will um, be able to uh, have something tentative for probably not the next meeting, but maybe the one after that. Um, hey, um, is there anything that the community development director would like to report? Super quick. Uh, so we do have four semi-permanent parklet structures going up. If you look at them, they'll really look semi-permanent and look very permanent. Uh, but the contractor estimates, uh, they should be done by next week. So if you'd like to take a stroll through downtown, this is in front of the Keys, Trattoria 360, Katie Blooms, and Flights. I thought that was like a total of five. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we had one that almost pulled permits that pulled out. So we just ended up with four. Okay. At some point, we'll circle back to City Council and see if they'd like to open up for a uh, next round. But uh, can I ask about, um, they're, they're using, uh, you know, great uh, concrete as the, 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 the major outside. Is, is that going to just stay gray? You know, is, is it going to be stay gray color? Is it going to stay gray as a color? I believe so. Yeah, so I'll have to look at, we have the renderings. We can you can talk to the Civic Improvement Commission, see if they want to do the gold mural contest. Yeah. Uh, look at the uh, um, I know they got, I know they got wood. I know they got wood and wooden paneling and, 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 and metal black metal stuff and things like that. I was just wondering about the outside being a right. <laughs> I think they're marvelous, but they go on. Yeah. No, I was just going to mention there. There is a um, a panel that circulates outside that has a. Sort of an homage to either an orchard or a water tower design. So how is it looking at that? Let's see that that is part of it. So we had a little, little, little tree cut out thing. Yes. So cool. A few last things. Uh, our environmental program specialist starts next Monday. This is a person who's going to oversee the climate action plan. So we're very happy that person is coming on board. Her name is Tiffany Hudson. And wish us luck. Uh, we had oral boards for our housing manager position. Passed on a few candidates. Uh, we're scheduled to interview those candidates next week. And very much hope we find a good candidate we can offer or hire and bring on board in the next month or two. That's all I have to Thank you very much. Uh, with that, um, we'll adjourn to our next meeting of October 24th, 2023. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Have a good night. Okay.